Hi, welcome to our 12th podcast of uh, Keen Minds, um, based on NBC's The Blacklist. And on this one, this is our third hiatus um, podcast in which we're going to focus on part two of the relationship of Tom and Liz. And on the last one, we left Tom leaving at the end of 119. He's walking into the night after they had that uh, great fight on the townhouse. And um, we are coming into the gun to the head. Yeah, which is definitely a huge one that people like to to go back to when they say that's where he passed the point of no return. Uh, but but that you see on, on various, you know, websites and stuff posted and commented on the, you know, that was the point of no return. That's when you know, you know, Red wouldn't hold a gun to her, which that's not true. Red has held a gun to her. But, you know, people, people that love people don't hold guns to their heads. And I will admit that scene... I think it was season three before I'd finally worked my way through it. So it is a tough, tough scene. And it took getting a lot of information and backstory and really understanding Tom Keene as as a person and the way his brain works, the way he sees things. Had to learn about his past with Bud and, and really come to an understanding before that scene made any sense to me. And I, I would like to think I have a pretty you know, at least a relatively decent, you know, handle on Tom's character. You do. See, that is a funny, and this, I, I have a feeling that we didn't, we look at things from different ways, but um, I look, the first time I saw that scene, is going to sound very weird, but I said, he's keeping her safe. It was the first thing that occurred to me when people were talking about the gun to the head. I was I couldn't understand where they were coming from. It was obvious to me that he wasn't the assassin dispatch. And had he wanted to kill her, in the car was so much easier and neater, and he didn't have to worry about a body or anything else. Just shoot her, get out and go. Job done. Right, so, exactly. This is going to be an interesting one. I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, to discuss it. Oh, I am too. And this this could be one of my favorite ones that we do right here because it's really what we have planned for, for today's podcast is really shifting into some of the lowest points for the Keens and then that upward incline that, that helped them start rebuilding. And so we're going through the end of season two today and that's, that's what we'll be focusing on. And so we have Liz in the car. Um, Cooper's just been gutted and uh, strangled got a just horrible situation which as so many people like to point out was to a degree Tom's fault because he gave over that list Mira died and Cooper nearly died I've always made the comment that I'm not sure like, why would they not know who the task force was that, that uh, information had been out for ages it's uh, I, I really feel like that was more of a give me this information to prove your loyalty sort of thing I agree in that point, 100%. Um, and if you see um, fake uh, kins, and I think we should maybe back in there maybe a little bit after after this. Um, absolutely. To me, that list was a proof of loyalty of fake Berlin, and it was a way of establishing. It's the same thing that Cooper does when he asks Tom to get character. And he says, I don't trust you, you're a, you're a liar, you're a thief. Things that he has no way of knowing that they may or may not be true. It's a way of establishing your do dominance over an operative. Uh, he is asking him to do something and he has to do it. To me, that's very simple. Uh, but I think we should back a little. And do we agree that Berlin never intended to hurt Liz? And that's the reason why Tom is saying I'm one of the good guys? I don't know. I, I have always been of the opinion that Tom, even if Berlin had come through in the end and said, okay, now kill her, that Tom was just ready to to turn his back on Berlin at that point because he'd already done it to Red. I mean, he'd already betrayed Red. So why on earth would it bother him to betray Berlin? You know, when it when it came down to that. And I assume that that's probably where that comes from. That's always been my approach to it. That when he said, I'm one of the good guys, 
his mm. thought process was, you know, work with Berlin as long as it keeps me in Liz's life and keeps Liz safe. But I've also got an eye on Berlin in case he ever tries something. And if he does, I'm there to protect her. And my loyalty lies with her, not with him particularly. I'm just making him think it lies with him. I, I agree. I agree there. I think you're you're right in, in my view. The, the one thing... <laughs> I, I never had seen that the task force got killed because Tom gave the list. The list was an, the list was what he what he inquired. I am I'm thinking of of the sequence of things and I'm thinking if I have to put the the guilt, he his was the operative guilt. He gave the list in fake Berlin use it to go after his own brand of of vengeance because once he's, he thought Berlin was dead, that's when he moves to dispose of the task force and dispose of Liz. Just before that, the task force was in no immediate danger. But the second that fake Berlin thinks Berlin dead, he takes over and does his own thing. Uh, but remember that Fitch hears this Here's the guy giving orders to his assassin to kill the task force, and he says nothing. He didn't, doesn't call Cooper and tells him, listen, your task force is in, in, in danger. Um, he doesn't call, he, does, he tells it to Red, and Red is a prisoner. Red has to break free and then calls Liz. But the t Mira would have been saved, and Harold would not have been hurt if Fitch upon understanding this, would have said that to, to Harold. Even if it was, listen, say is an anonymous tip, but yeah. save them. So he had no interest in saving them. And I thought it was pretty good when he actually ends up exploding in, in the post office because it was, it was fitting. I mean, he, he did that. And I also think it may have been even on their own, you know, to their own advantage because Mira was really, even if she didn't know that she was, she was really a cabal plant. She was working for for Diane Fowler, and Diane Fowler was a cabal operative. She wasn't a big cabal person, but she was an operative. She was following orders from them. So uh, to me, the, the that was a cleaning up of, of that that was perfectly fine with them because there was no traces. Yeah, I agree so, with that. I do. Um and and then at the end, it was him who who got Berlin going after Red. So, yes, Tom has the operative guilt of making the actual list, but not he was in. It's like if you go into the criminal system, you don't go only after the guy who actually yields the gun, but the guy who ordered the gun to be yielded. Bit like how Scotty was just hired. How all yeah. of that was just hired go to Kirk behind the hiring. Yeah. yeah. If it's not her, it's going to be somebody else. And that's true. That's very true. And I, I think a lot of times when people blame Tom for that, a lot of that has to do with wanting to place blame, blame on him. And Liz says, oh, if she has the, 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 the task force, they it's because she gave them. But the truth is they could have found it another way. And then there is another interesting thing in there, which is, that Agent Martin takes Cooper out of the post office where he was safe to have a meeting in a park of all places. Why? It wasn't something that he could say in the post office after he's been talking all kind of classified things in the post office. So and to me, there is something in that incident that hasn't been completely uh, clear up that I think we might learn a little more about that. I never trusted Martin like, at all. <laughs> no. He was as astros worthy as they come. Yeah, definitely. And so you've got Tom, and he gets into the car with Liz. After all this, she's distraught, she's worried. And you hear her blame him later when she's talking to um, to uh, Samuel Leco, And he's, she said, you know, I told you that when I found the guy responsible for Mira... That, that mm -hmm. we, you know, get revenge on him, basically. And so he, she, he, she blamed Tom for a while for Cooper and for Mira. And so whether rightfully or wrongfully, she blamed them. And th mm -hmm. that's probably also another reason that people 
blame Tom is because Liz mm. came out and said it. Um, can, but, can we establish that Tom was not the guy that uh, fake Berlin was tasking to find Liz? Oh, absolutely not. Okay. I, I don't so, think so, no. It was um, the same other guy with the little thing that that, uh, that wrestler was a lovely scene with him in which he tells them about the greasy Russians killing their friends. It was delightful. I love no. wrestling there. I, I definitely do not think that Tom was on the... I mean, he was getting into the car with Liz while, you know... You know, he was making the threat, and then Red was coming through the door. That was all happening at the same time. No, I do not believe that, because he went straight to Liz. Yeah. I, I also think that, why do you think he took her to fake Berlin and and went in, considering that the guys obviously didn't commit suicide, a mass suicide? <laughs> all the dead bodies? Like, I've wondered <laughs> that many times. I actually don't have an answer for that one. I I've wondered why, I mean... Was he hoping to make Red explain things? I doubt it. I mean, because he wasn't willing to explain them. I have no idea why he did that. It does not. The only explanation I've ever come up with is when Tom, is, especially at that point in first season Tom, when put in emotionally compromising situations, he makes some really stupid calls. That's, yeah, that's the I, only I thing think. I've ever been able to come up with is that he was desperate, he was scared, he tried to save Liz, and made a really crappy call. I don't think so. I don't think so. This is, I mean, hear me out. This is what I think. Tom knows that he has just given the list. Why does he give the list to fake Berlin? To me, because he's called there. He's obviously unarmed, so... Fake Kinski, Kinski's guards took his gun out and let him go in that in that room where Kinski is staying, which is not the office where he was later, um, without any weapons. Kinski is armed very prominently and is meeting him. So obviously this is a situation where Tom can't do anything. So what are his options? He gives them the list or he denies the list or he leaves list of the list. Denying the list will get him killed because then he's being compromised. So right there, Kinski takes a gun, shoots him. Liz dies too. Uh, he omits Liz. I think Kinski, it was a, a trial. Kinski already knew who the, the people were because remember, th this is Berlin has been following him and Berlin has... Tom and Tom already knows what the what the uh, task force is. So if he was knowing it, he knew before, not back then. So I think that was a test by fake Berlin. So the only option he had is what Red says: we do it for real or we don't do it at all. He gives them the list, and then he takes Liz at gunpoint. At that point, he has no point where he's safe that he that they don't know. The safest spot for him is to go and find Red. Because this is two enemies going at each other, and there is no place for him to be safe with Liz. I think he, it was not perhaps the best decision, but I don't think he had many. It's like Liz going to the Russian embassy. She had not many options left. So Tom takes her and goes to fake Berlin, intending to either get in there, and when he's there, kill fake Berlin, or see what's going on he sees the the dead guards that is his clue that red is already there not the fbi because you would see a bunch of cars it's just red so red is there and the guys are dead probably red has the upper hand but it's possible that red got there and fake berlin has the upper hand i find interesting that when he goes in there he still goes in so that was what he intended but he enters the room not with a with the gun to Liz's head, but to the gun to the room. Because he didn't know if fake Berlin was had the upper hand, then he could shoot fake Berlin. But if Red had the upper hand, Red will try to shoot him. And I do think that Tom was banking on the fact that he knew that Red was not going to shoot Liz. And then obviously he wasn't going to shoot Liz. Mm -hmm. And so... I mean, I, I know people have issues with him using her as a shield. And I understand that. It's, I mean, the, the image there is jarring. 
But when you know the other man is not going to shoot her, you know you're not going to shoot her, yes, she's in danger because you have weapons with the safeties off and, you know, dangerous situations there. But the entire situation was fraught with danger at that point. And so having her in between them like that was probably the safest place for her. Yeah. Also, he had to protect himself because at that point he had lost the protection of Liz Love. So Ren would have killed him without a doubt because the only thing protecting Tom from Ren was Liz Love. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he didn't have it. So... I also think that he knew at that point that there was a possibility that he would lost the protection of the Major. Even if he were to be able to, you know, get away from it. If he went and said, so, by the way, this is the Fed, and Bud would have shot him dead right then. I mean, he knew it. You know, he couldn't go running home. Yeah, I don't think that he had many options left to keep himself alive and Liz alive. So I think he took the only thing that made sense to him. Let's go to the danger, the last place they expect me. They, if the if the guys once he sees the the dead guys, he goes up, he points the gun at Red at the room when he enters, and then I find interesting what he does and what he does not. He doesn't say to Red, um, "Get him loose" at all. He oh. just says, "Put the gun down." To, to neutralize the situation. And Grant keeps pointing the gun at him. He's leaving out of options. And he keeps, he doesn't do anything. If he intended to get uh, fake, uh, fake uh, Berlin, he would have done it. He would have asked Red, untie him or kill her. At that point, that gun is still at the room. It's only when Red, who wants the answers when Red is not doing anything, finally he puts the gun to his head, forcing Red to do what he wanted them to do, kill fake Berlin. And then Red puts the gun down, and that would have been a safe place. He comes at him with bare hands. I'm going to take the gun from you. You know, make a decision, make it quick. And Tom is not a person who can make a quick decision correctly in that situation. Not, of not with that stress. emotional, the, the, the emotional pressure there. You're right. I think he can act okay when in an in a undercover situation, but not with that those high emotional stakes. And I think that's what, what gets him. And that's the difference is he was not undercover there. That was him. That was all him. With the woman he loved, trying to protect her, trying to protect himself, trying to get out alive. Yeah. And and had Red not pushed him to let her go, had Red trusted that and gave him space, he would just push Liz into the room and run out. But Red made made the, the, the mistake because Red cannot predict Tom to go towards him. And I always say to the people... Who got hurt there? Tom. And that is telling. It was interesting, their faces when that gun went off. Because, I mean, Liz, when Tom shoots Red, I mean, he clips him on the arm. Which, also, we've seen before, and we mentioned this in the the Red and Tom episode. But Tom is not a bad shot. He's a very talented shot, and he clips him. That's a very purposeful action there. Liz takes the opportunity, you know turns on him, struggles for the gun, but their expressions when the gun first goes off, you see it in Tom's face that he is terrified he just shot her. Because there's there's that moment before your brain clicks in, well, that hurt, you know, that, that delay there with that kind of shock. And, I mean, you hear it described as shock to the system, you know. Yeah. Do, do you agree with, with my take on the situation or you had a slightly different from character development of, of those uh, moments b- until the until uh, Tom gets shot? That makes sense. Yes, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. But that I mean, that makes a whole lot more sense than anything else I've ever been able to come up with. So. And, and it's funny because that's a, the first time I saw that scene. I, that's exactly how I read it. It's like, but I think that Red was not totally on board with Tom being in love with Liz. That's what I always say. Tom, he really got that down when he talked to Aleko. Yeah. 
when that. he found out what happened on that boat. Um, he may have had suspicions back then, but I'm not sure that they were um, well-founded. So I love, I love that moment, you know, when, and because one of the most in, interesting things in that scene to me is when Liz shoots him the first time and instead of backing away, which is the most human reaction, you back away to protect yourself. He walks towards her. Like he wants to say, I, I, I didn't want to do anything bad to you. It, it's a, it, with a pleading expression. He's not threatening. He's not a threat anymore. You're being shot in the abdomen. You're not a threat. No, oh, and then she shoots him twice more. <laughs> so it's, yeah. And I, that scene there... That, that's the first time, probably, I, I don't know where the split was for one, one A and one B, but certainly the first time since, since you found out who he was, that you really, you know, not, not, I mean, obviously in hindsight, it's a whole lot easier to see, but as you're watching it, first time through the episodes, I think that's the first time you really get that there might have been something there. Just the looks that they gave each other at that point. Liz isn't willing to let Red kill him. You know, regardless of how mm-hmm. angry she is, she still loves him. She tries to stop the bleeding. He leans in and tells her the secret. And just that moment, as it, twisted as it is, it, it's kind of a sweet moment between them. You know, the because he thinks he's dying, and she thinks he's dying. And I would love mm-hmm. to know how she got him out to the car. You know, I will drag him. I, 180 pounds is <laughs> still pretty heavy for what five 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 six. I mean, <laughs> but she's trained, and he may be able to like yeah, you he... know kind of walk. You know, if he supported himself on on her. Yeah. And you know, when uh, adrenaline gives you an in, an incredible strength. Yeah. You know, and... I've seen people do things with adrenaline. I've done myself things, you know, under the influence of adrenaline that I wouldn't be able to even accomplish without them. I'm just, I've always thought about how much I had to have hurt, though. <laughs> you know, it was, oh, oh, just sounds so painful. Because from what I understand, getting shot in the gut is the most painful, you know, place mm. to get shot. From, I mean, I've never been shot. I can't attest from personal experience, but... From what I understand. From the horse's mouth, yeah. Um, one, of, one of the... Um, one of the things that intrigued me about that scene is that Red leaves. He actually leaves. He doesn't wait to see what she does. He actually leaves. That is... That is a respect that is interesting to me. And I don't buy it. There were police there. There no, weren't police obvi- there. Obviously, she got him out and got him into the car without being seen. So, And their body's all over. The police is not going to arrive there. Just the police. They're going to take the this, this SWAT teams. and So do you think that Red was interested? What? Wanted to see what she would do or give her the room to let him live if. I think. Was that a reflection on Katerina? I think that he knew it was a decision she had to make for herself. She couldn't be pressured into it or else she would have. Tom makes the comment in the boat later if you kill me, you'll never be rid of me. You know, we, we will be tied together for the rest of your life. And I think Red understands that too. That if he. If she decides that she wants to kill him, that that's that's fine by him. He's happy with that. But it can't be a decision that he is making for her or else she will turn all of her spite about it back on Red. He has to give her the space to make that decision for herself that she has to be okay with it within herself to do it. If, if does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, and I do wonder if at one time the person then that, um, it, it, this is a crazy idea, but the, the person who deserved to die in his eyes was Katerina. It, it's an, is a, 
idea not supported by anything, but something in that dialogue in Cape May keeps bothering me. Not killing somebody who deserved to die. And and I do wonder, you know, if at some point Red thought about it. Thought about killing and, Katarina? And, yeah, and, and this, this scene with Tom and Liz was a reflection, and that's why he knew that he had to let her make that call. He couldn't make it for her. Maybe. And it may have been a choice that he had to make, and, you know, now it's her turn sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think those are all valid options and valid possibilities that make a lot of sense with the character development and with the characters as we've been given them and seen for three and a half seasons with them. Um, I find funny that people only see um, the superficial gun to the head and they don't see the the underlying. That was the best he could do. Well, good decision or bad decision to keep her safe. You know, Red had done pretty bad things to keep her safe, including hiring a spy, you know, and then falling in love. And then he goes and hires another one. You know, always nice, good-looking guys to take care of his good-looking daughter, who's the daughter of a famous uh, honey trap. Somehow, and a pretty charming man. Somehow, there's a faulty something there. And I think with that, um, we get to the boat. Yeah, and one thing about the boat that I've always wondered, what on earth did Liz have on Ellie? Because she said, you owe me one. When she called Ellie, taking him to the boat, mm-hmm. she calls Ellie, Tom's bleeding out in her back seat, and she calls Ellie and says, you know, I need you to come here, you owe me one. We've never found out what Ellie owes her, we've never found out why Ellie owes her anything, is Ellie sketchier than we ever thought? Ellie also showed up at Liz's funeral, which was interesting. I still feel like we need to go back to Ellie and find out more about her, because I'm convinced there's a reason she showed up in season three, I just don't know what it is yet. I wonder if they are pals from when Liz was a criminal and she helped her clean up her records so she could get into medical school and, and get her license as a realtor and whatever else, and be a teacher. <laughs> Ellie is a uh, many, many job aspirations there. Yeah. Quite a woman. Hey, um, maybe she had to work hard to, uh, to pay for her medical school. False but I, I do wonder if it's something of that sort because they do seem it's the only friend that they brought back none of the other ones and and she figured you know she's the one taking Tom to the physical therapy making him an omelet and then she shows up taking care of Red and in her uh, of Tom and in her funeral so yeah. interesting. I feel like with the funeral, if they had just wanted someone we'd seen before as a, you know, as someone for Tom to know, for Tom to have there, mm-hmm. you know, that they could have gone with Aunt June. Aunt June would have made more sense to me than bringing Ellie back for absolutely no reason. So I, I keep going back to there's a reason that Ellie was there. I just don't know what it is yet. Yeah, I'm I'm sure that some of those might, might be taking up. I, I have great confidence in the writers. And the more I go back and, and look at things that, I didn't even cross my radar, and I, you know, four seasons later, I'm, ah, that's what that was. Hmm, look at that little detail there. But it's the entire, I love the flashbacks. I'm, they don't do a lot of flashbacks in the Blacklist, and I, I was so excited in the Decemberist when we got those flashbacks to four months previous, mm-hmm. you know, and starting off oh. when he gets shot... You know, in the car, on the way, the back, you know, back alley surgery, and all of that was just, it It was very interesting to me. Yeah, well, not only that, it was, it was, an, um, for those who think that Liz is this uh, do-goody who uh, goes by the rules, do you know that Liz knew two days into the her interrogation, which is two days after basically he woke up from whatever thing he was uh, unconscious for only a couple of days, that um, Berlin had his money on, on Monarch Douglas Bank. So when the task force is given the Monarch Douglas Bank, she knows exactly what Red is doing. And she says nothing. Yeah, she is playing a long game through that entire four months. And it 
it was really well done. Megan did great with it. I mean, she she played it off very well. And she was in an incredibly dark, you know, uh, Liz was in an incredibly dark place there. Uh, it, to me, the boat was definitely a low point for her. The lowest, you think? Well, how about for him? For him, I think it's, and, and we talked a little bit about this outside the podcast. I'm, I, I still am not sure which I think is the lowest point for him. It's either when he chose anger over the truth in the living room when he when he freaked out when she had him tied to the chair and everything and he decided that he'd prefer to piss her off than to be honest with her and tell her the truth or when he did the exact same thing in the boat it's that like I understand why he does it but it's still I feel like it's a low point for him because it's like on the boat what did he have to lose you know and and I think at that point he was just so angry he was in pain he was sick and he was pissed and when Tom Keene gets angry, he's not a nice person. And so he's he's not someone you want to get into an argument with if he's bitter about anything. <laughs> and so I, I think the boat might have been a little bit more of a low point because he had nothing to lose at that point. He he thought he was a there was a really good chance he was a dead man walking and barely walking at that point. And yet he was just bitter right there. Mm. So and uh, Tristan might have been the lowest of the low, but but between when Liz was actually there, probably the boat. Okay, and and for Liz, the boat. I I yeah. I tend to think the boat is, the boat is when she descended into a darkness. Um, what was it Red called it? You know, here in this filth. I mean, he yeah. was. I I think Red. We've talked about before that we think that Red knew tom was alive or at least had a really good idea that he was alive mm -hmm. i don't think he knew the extent that you know i think he we've mentioned before just playing house like had him held up somewhere that yeah you know maybe she was holding him against his will maybe she wasn't she was tapping him for information and they were playing house and then he finds out that that she, wasn't yeah, yeah she, there he were finds out that, yeah <laughs> yeah wrong kind of house um <laughs> It's yeah, it's an interesting uh, symbol there that the place that they chose to keep uh, to have Liz keep Tom, it's a boat, and you get a lot of parallels with Red kept in a boat with Tom buying a boat later. The water, it's you're getting Tom closer and closer to the water symbols. Yeah, which is interesting for a man that can't swim, and so. I still want that to come back around as well. I, I need I'm to know sure if he's. He I need to learn. I need to know if he's like able to go in the water yet, and why he was never able to swim. Because I'm sorry, but Master Spy, how did he manage to get around swimming for nearly thirty years? I'm sure it, it's gonna it's gonna come out because there's a big theme of water and drowning, and and Tom is associated with water as Red is. But I mean, we're in the boat. They are they're incredibly sweet moments in that boat. They're, I think that Tom, this is the, the boat to me is interesting not only because what you know it changed the victim into a victimary, which is not the best way to go around not being a, a victim, but it's one way. Um, it's very, very dramatic. It's a very unhealthy way, but you're also looking at as we've mentioned and as Megan you know, commented on, on the Blacklist Exposed, it's a heightened reality. In the world that they live in, I think it almost took something that extreme for Liz to move past mm -hmm. what yeah. happened. She, she, had to, she had to regain a sense of control, and, and she chose to do that. And, and I think, in a way, it was Tom's salvation. Absolutely and completely. This is the first time in Tom's life. I'm sure that he had been held captive many times in his life, that he'd survived many things here and another. I mean, his life has been adventures. But this is the first time that he cannot run. He, even in a prison somewhere else, he can't run, but not here because emotionally he can't run. He's being held in chains by a woman who keeps going and interrogating him. And I think he's forced to understand what he means. And there's a point in which he asks, 
you never asked me if I really loved you. What's your take on that moment? I loved it. <laughs> it was, I loved that line so much because I think he was curious at that point. Like, like, was there ever a moment that you thought maybe it was real? You know, because I think it, he was probably questioning it himself at that point. You know, was it real? Was I in too deep? What, what's going on? Why could I never shake this? What broke me? You know, I mean, he's, I, I, I would love to see what happened to him once Liz let him loose. That point of time between when he walks away and calls Bud and has that conversation. Because there's, a, he leaves D.C., there's time between D.C., and then he goes to see Red, and there's time between that and going and seeing Bud in New York City. And so there's a point in time in there that it was just him trying to gather himself. And I would love to see what, what happened at that point. Um, but I, I think that was him trying to work through those emotions and wonder if she had ever seen it as well. I don't think he was really playing at anything. You know, I don't think he was particularly trying to manipulate her any more than that was just kind of his go-to. I mean, there was a good point of time in there between, you know, in season one and well into season two that manipulation came as easy to him as breathing. I mm -hmm. mean, it just, he did it without even thinking. And yeah, so, like Red Dog. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, it, you do what you got to do. I mean, it wasn't necessarily even that he was trying to manipulate someone. It just, that was the easier path. He took it. It was subconscious. And then he's like, oh, well, oops, you know. <laughs> but I think a lot of people do manipulate a lot, even if they're not aware they do. Oh, it's, yeah, I think it's human nature. I mean, if you can get away with things... Um, and you're not actually hurting people, I think that human nature will try to make, to take advantage. I mean, it, it takes a lot of self-control to say, let me not do that because it's not right. But I, it, you see it in kids. They manipulate like, they're master manipulators. A two-year-old, three-year-old kid knows everything there is to know about manipulation. And in a way, if you think about it, that's exactly the age at what he was taking. And he just continued. He survived out of those. Yeah, I agree. And so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. And I feel like that was probably his most honest moment on that boat. Where, you know, she said, well, I know the answer. And he says, I don't think you do. I think that was probably his most honest moment. I mean, I think he told her a lot of things. I think that... You know, people say, oh, well, they haven't talked about this and they haven't talked about that. I think they talked about a lot on that boat. I think she knew everything about Gina. I think she knew everything about Jolene. I think he was, she obviously knew his name, the, the yes. Jacob Phelps name. Yeah, and so he told I think, her. I think, and then I think that she, that gave her an opening to go track a bunch of stuff down. It's probably how she found his shelf. Um, Corporations yeah. and... And I always been curious about, you know, that money. Did she really give it to the FBI or is she, she's given to keeping things for herself very much like Red. Well, interesting. I mean, it could have been when she sold the, the apartment at the Opry, but she's an FBI agent. She doesn't get just a huge paycheck. Her mm -hmm. ex-husband at the time, you know, was a school teacher. He certainly didn't get a big paycheck. And yet when, when she's consolidating all of her money with her financial planner after Ames dies, after, after Tom kills mm -hmm. Ames, and her financial planner goes, that's a lot of money. I mean, and when a financial planner who is used to dealing with people with a lot of money goes, that's a lot of money, that's a pretty high price tag there. So where is all that coming from? Mm. It, I think some of it may have been coming from Sam's state, uh, because if Red was funneling money through him um, to help support her, he may have saved some and may have saved. But definitely, there is something in all that thing that tells me Liz is not exactly the person who would turn everything back. And, you know, like the way we talked about, did she really take took Red's money, or he, she said she did. Liz is to me not a not a 
above board character. She can do things that are not right if she feels that they will give her whatever she wants, in, in a less degree than Red and, and Tom, but I she, think she does. She's a means to the end to mm-hmm. a person, like yeah. Tom is, like Red is. Mm-hmm. And th- there's there's also interesting things. Um, there's a, mo- a couple of moments in that boat that we see a lot of desperation in Tom. Like, like he's really thinking, I'm going to spend the rest of my life here or she's going to kill me. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of it comes from being ill because I, I've gone through with the numbers before and let's see, a day into it, he wakes up, He's his wrists are tied together with duct tape. There's, his hands are still covered in blood, by the way. So it's not like he's been cleaned up or anything. He's in this filthy, filthy hull of a ship on a disgusting mattress. I mean, it just... I'm like, seriously, that's what you did? Okay, you're making your point, sweetheart. Um, yeah, a lot of people get, get angry when he calls her a bitch. She was being a bitch. I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't well-earned, but it doesn't mean that she wasn't. I mean, and the fact is that that was the first day in. He was coming out of what you hope was anesthesia. Because, eh, I think trying to perform that surgery, he would have been dead if they tried to do that without anesthesia. So he had to have had some form of anesthesia. For the surgery. and But he's coming out of that. He's in massive amounts of pain. Because they can't possibly have all the painkillers there. That they would have had in the hospital. And so. The man is in a lot of pain. He's really sick. You know. I'm going to cut him a little slack. On what he calls her at that point. <laughs> and. Um, yeah. And she's just. The first thing she says is. I didn't save you because I care for you. I save you because I want you have information I want. I just remember sitting there during that episode and saying, the lady doth protest a little too much. You know, if that's the first thing that needs to come out of your mouth, Liz, you're trying to but convince she's yourself. Believable. But she, she was believable. I, I think that even him may have been a little concerned there for his well-being. Uh, and, and then there's a point where he has a horrendous infection. And Liz says, if you want uh, Ellie to look at that infection, you're going to have to give me something. Yeah, and that's like a full month or two into it, best I remember. Mm -hmm. And that's, what does that mean for his healing rate? You know, this is a man that that doesn't scar very much because obviously, I mean, he's, like we've said earlier, he's lived a very adventurous life. And obviously he didn't have any scars that his wife was, you know, taking Mm -hmm. notice of, you know, in the two years of marriage there. And, um... And so he, he obviously doesn't scar a great deal. I would assume he's probably a pretty quick healer with that. And so a month or two in, he's he's got this infection. He's just he's not gotten good medical care. And she's use she's leveraging his health for information. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something, you know, when people try They call to, that torture. Yeah, it is torture and he calls her on it too. Multiple times, best I remember. Um, but when people try to say, "Oh, well, you know, she's she's an innocent little flower," no, you know, I'm sorry, she she tortured him and leveraged his health for for information. That's and she stabbed Brad. She run over the freelancer. And for anyone who thinks Liz is a nice little flower on the wall, go take a look at that scene and see the face she has after she gets off that cab. She's triumphant. She just run a guy over on the basis that Red said that he was a freelancer. He may have been an innocent bystander for all she knows. Yeah. And there he is. He has a compound fracture with a bone sticking out of his thigh. And then he gets Mira. So I guess Liz was the least of his troubles. But, uh, you know, and he she punches Rostov. She poisons the Dr. Volgo. Yeah. No. I, I've She's never not been, wrestler. I've never been worried about Liz being able to take care of herself. Not once. I, and I think that, that when we get... And that is an interesting way of sedging into the day. The day when Ames decides that he's going to inspect from zebra muscles. Did you buy his story? I did. 
did. I know that you and I have talked about this. I, I really did. Um, I guess because I didn't have any reason not to. I mean, he seems like an, you know, he, he seemed like a pretty above, mm. above ground kind of person. As far as you can tell, um, I, I don't know anything about a harbor master's position. If they carry, I mean, he could have had a, a concealed handgun license. I mean, I, if he's going and inspecting a place, he'd already been there once and it was sketchy. So he may have gone home and gotten a gun to protect himself since he was going back. Especially since Liz said that there were, you know, um, escape fugitives there. I mean, so mm. that, that may have been why he went back and got a gun. Um and came back alone with a backup, even though he's he's a cop. Uh, yeah, I mean, but how many times has Liz gone You're to places going... without backup? I mean, yeah, people do but, things. But that is Liz, and she's an FBI in an elite unit, in an elite under, in basically black op unit. A, a harbor master, he goes home, tells his wife about uh, some strange thing, and goes back in the boat. Now... You're a cop. You are going to, you say that you receive an anonymous tip, which in itself was very suspicious. Who found that anonymous tip about um, a suspicious activity on the boat? So he goes to the boat and he meets federal agent who tells her, to tells him, you know, it identifies herself, tells him that they got a tip about some es escapees from a prison, Cumberland, and that she checked and is fine and gives him a very credible thing of why he hasn't been contacted um, because somebody else is running points. I would say that had I been Harbor Master, I see a federal agent tell me it is fine, and I say, great, you know what, I'll let it go. And he come, He goes home, tells his wife a story, doesn't go to his office, doesn't doesn't file a report, doesn't take back up. He takes a gun and he goes back the same day, waits until there is nobody on board and enters the boat. Now, remember when he goes, when um, Detective Wilcox is investigating? He goes to the wife and they, she tells a story that he has a bit of a gambling problem because he goes to Atlantic City and, and he's gone for a couple of days or two, and, but always calls or comes back, right? Now, remember the story tell, Red tells a woman when he's looking for Karakurt? Exactly that. Oh, he gambled and lost his college fund for the kid, and he has a terrible gambling problem. So I'm thinking that Ames wasn't an innocent bystander there, that somebody paid him to go take a look. Do you or think somebody... Red paid him? I don't know if it's Red, honestly. I thought for a while when I thought that, Ron, that Tom was working for Katerina, that it was Katerina, but I don't know. I, I, I honestly couldn't even venture a guess, but somebody called that, and the fact that Red used to kind of put it in there, he may have a, got an idea that that's where Tom was living. Um, but he, the, the use of the story is so similar that kind of like, hmm, there's something there, and I always take those little somethings seriously because eventually they add up. And then... You know, he comes back. We have no idea what happens because we see this face of relief of Tom. But then we don't know what happened. We had no idea there was a conversation. All that you know is that, oh, he had a gun and, and it's me or him. And I always just kind of assumed that the reason Tom shifted is because... Aleko walks back in, and then all of a sudden, he sees Aleko. Aleko, you know, beats him over the head, knocks him kooky. And then Ames sees Liz. And as soon as he sees Liz, that makes him a problem. Because if he sees Liz, if he sees Aleko, it's not a big deal. Okay, send Aleko to prison. Bye. You know. But if he sees Liz, 
then Liz is suddenly going to prison for torture and, you know, wrongful, wrongful imprisonment. imprisonment and, yeah. and so that becomes an issue for Tom at that point because regardless of how angry he is at her, he loves her. And he may not understand it, but he does. And so when push comes to shove, he kills the man that could free him. I, I think also there is there is a, another level of, of fear in Tom. Alec, at this moment, Aleko is getting very nervous. He's Before AIM shows up, he's talking to Liz in what I assume Tom can hear, because they're just outside the room, telling him that she has to kill him. Mm-hmm. That it's four months that they that you got to call somebody, and I know somebody. I'm not a killer, but I'll find someone. And then Ames shows up, he gets hit over the head, and and I think Tom is thinking here, this guy is going to go over, take a gun, come back, kill me, kill Liz, and kill Ames, take the boat to sea, and dump all the three bodies there, and problem solved, he's... I don't know anything. I haven't seen anybody. That's it. Because for Aleko is now looking at, he's an ex-con. He's an informant. He's an ex-con and he's looking at prison time. So one murder, two murders, three murders, same to him. Yeah. His life. No, and one of, two of them are cops. So no. I think that that moment Tom had to do something that would, because the situation spoke of lack of control. Liz was not in control. Liz was panicking. Ames was there. And Aleko was panicking. And I think Tom did what Tom had to do to get the situation in control and save at least himself and Liz. That was the only two that he could save. He couldn't save Ames. For him, I think that's really what mattered. Because at that point, we don't see a shift in Tom in which he cares about the... the um... Uh, collateral damage. Innocent bystander. Yeah, yeah, the innocent bystanders, the collateral damage. We don't see that shift until um, until Asher yeah. Sutton. Yeah. And so I don't think he cared about Ames. I mean, when, when he's talking to the judge later, he's like, I don't even remember his name. And I think it kind of strikes him that that's mm-hmm. weird, isn't it? That's not normal. You know, <laughs> most mm-hmm. normal people remember the name of the person, you know. But he's probably got such a list of people he's killed. I bet he's lost count at this point in his life. Um... But yeah, yeah. And but, so, but regardless of the situation, I think it does boil down to the fact that he was trying to protect Liz. Yeah. That is the one truth, regardless of if Ames was innocent, if Ames wasn't mm-hmm. innocent. Yeah. It still boils down to the fact that, that Liz was in danger and Tom was protecting her. Mm-hmm. And, and she knows that um, because she says it to Wrestler later. And I, it could have been part of what encouraged her to release him i don't know you know i i don't i i've i've questioned multiple multiple times because i think that tom there there were many times that he thought liz was about to kill him that in the end she was going to kill him and i'm not sure she ever really had it in her because i think i mean she was so angry with him when she shot him and yet you know red could have killed him and and it would have taken you know it would have taken out of her hand she could have let him do it in that fit of rage and yet she didn't she saved his life and so i don't think in cold blood she would have been able to bring herself to do it but but i and i think that by that time because we see that scene we have that very great scene when Red sees her and, and tells her there's nothing wrong with you. You know, because she's she's like, I don't understand why, you know, I thought I could do it. I, I thought I was in control. And and the truth is, is I didn't. And I thought, you know, that's one of the best scenes uh, in the blacklist. That's certainly my 20 best scenes of the blacklist, that, that one. It's it's an it's fantastic, yeah, with him just holding on to her and saying, you know, that's what love is—being out of control. 
And, and I think in them in that scene, in that moment of of utter vulnerability, Liz is telling us to what really happened there. You know, she tried to be in control. She went in, into a descent of darkness um, that got Red very worried about. And and I, I think knowing what we do know about Katarina, we see that he's probably been down that path as well to some degree. Mm-hmm. And that, that he, it, it's kind of like at the end of season two when Red was in there and said, I didn't want you to be me. You know, I feel like that's one of those glimpses he got of, oh my gosh, she's she's going down this path. And mm. I, I've had a lot of complaints about how Red handles Liz's emotional well-being, that sometimes he just kind of has a disconnect from that emotional, and he's like, you know, you've got to push through with this, you've got to push through with this, because he's more worried about keeping her alive in mm-hmm. a lot of cases, which is fair. I'm not I'm not knocking him for it, but it, it just kind of frustrates me. Um, mm. It's a hyper-reality. It is, it is, but it's... I've always seen, it's it's just bothered me, but right there, in that moment, he has such a great way of, of trying to comfort her there. In a way that, I mean, nothing was going to be able to comfort her, but if anything would have, Red did really well there. So I always feel like I need to give kudos when I'm, mm. <laughs> on things I complain <laughs> the most about. <laughs> and so when... I, I think we also skip a little bit that, you know, Rent hires Ezra, because obviously one time hiring a nice, uh, good-looking guy, young, uh, didn't, you know, didn't go badly enough, so we hire another one. And this one gets taken by the fake um, uh, striptease. <laughs> it is, you know, it's hilarious. And then he finds her in the boat and still gives her a reprieve and pay for his life for that one. You know, oh, yeah. this was a bitch to that poor guy. Is Ezra still in prison? I mean... <laughs> he was under no contact order. And then after, soon after that is the, the descent <laughs> from Liz into, uh, into, into um, the, the whole arc of being framed. And we never heard about him. So I assume she threw him in prison. And that's it. I feel like he's in a hole somewhere, which is kind of sad. Poor Ezra. <laughs> you know, I, I was always kind of fond of Ezra. I, I would love to see. Maybe he'll come back around someday. Maybe they'll realize what happened. He'll come back around. And I would love Could to look see. Look a guy him... like that rotting in prison oh. for being, for feeling sorry about her and giving her a chance. Poor guy. But I would love to see his expression if he did come back. And Liz is talking to him. Liz is talking to him. Tom walks up and he's just like, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, Ezra was a fun character, and I love those red herrings they gave us when the the, the 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 glasses in the car, and we everybody was sure that there was Tom uh, watching her. I also think that we skip one very little important thing there. You remember in the front? She already had Tom in the she had Tom in the boat. And she's looking at the baby, and she's starting to miss him. She misses him. She misses the family they were going to have. Yeah. It's, that, that is a just wrenching scene right there with her watching. Because you know, it's like she's looking at it and going, I will never have this. Mm-hmm. And which makes Agnes so much better. Um, and then we had like... Liz was living in the hotel. She was always sad. Her hair was dirty all the time. She was wearing like black and gray clothing. This is the closest thing to wearing a sack. Never um, smiled. I mean, she the the lack of smiling there, and because Megan has this gorgeous smile, she really does. It just it lights. She's one of those lights the whole room up. People when she smiles, and I can't recall. It's, when Cooper came back. That's the yes. only time I can recall her smiling the entire time Tom is in the boat. That day, she cut her hair. It was like cutting out her, her appearance is, is, is like a rite of passage. But it's, I find it funny that Red thinks she's sad because she's living in a motel. So she buys her the apartment and she basically ignores her. He tries with everything. And at the end, I think Red realizes... That, that's what I mean about the emotional disconnect that he has with her sometimes, is that he thinks he can just buy her things and fix it, do something for her and fix it. And he nev- I think that's because he didn't connect the fact that 
she was he didn't still want in, it. He didn't want no, no. I I agree one hundred percent with you on that. But it's and this is skipping ahead some, but um Go know, ahead. <laughs> we skip a lot. <laughs> we are. Sorry guys. This one's really all over the place. We we apologize for that. We do have notes, I swear. Um but the the scene in the in the motel later when Tom's there and and he says you know I want you to imagine your life without him here and she did <laughs> yeah and she knew it she knew exactly what that was like and she was miserable and and, and the funny thing is Red has no clue what no. she when she tells him I do I already did I know it, it's like oh you have no clue and we start seeing her smile again in season three when she comes back from from being on the run and she walks up and she it's that moment when she chooses tom you know she's not on the run she's not you know fighting an enemy she just she's finally at peace as well as she can be and she walks up and she goes to him that's the moment we start seeing her smile again we, she actually did smile um in uh, king of the roads king yeah. of the roads well, I mean, she did she smile smiled, she smiled um at the birthday dinner between she and wrestler it's not that she never smiled it's just the the rarity of the smile mm -hmm. yeah and that it became once once uh in in 3b that's where it really started becoming more of a regular occurrence again mm -hmm. that we but, saw her but... smile and laugh and tease and just generally a lot happier but at this point liz is miserable liz you know he has the the dirty hair and it then we get to the to the decemberist and and you know he kills her goes free and he basically goes to and he basically leaves i mean it's that time where he leads them to berlin and leaves it's the next goodbye well i mean for liz when she let him go that day, as far as she's aware, she's never going to see him again. And I think that hurt. Like, even though she was keeping him in a boat and it was entirely unhealthy and, you know, it was just a horrible, dark moment for her. She's watching him walk away and she's she's thinking, you know, it's one of those, my husband is gone. Like, mm -hmm. she in and, season one, my husband is gone. And there I love the fact that it's wrestler who calls her in it. Yeah, but you're not in, in love with Reddington. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, I, wrestler can see it clear as day that Liz is still in love with Tom. And wrestler know that he was, she was keeping him prisoner. You know, this is this is Liz at the at the lowest of the low, and and she's she's actually called Red so that Red kills Berlin. That is also a, a dark point because this is this is Liz actually acknowledging. Yeah, I want this guy dead. Yeah. I don't blame her for that, though. Because Mira was dead. Cooper nearly died. You know, and, and she says, you know, Tom was in my life because of him. She doesn't know why Tom was in her life. But yeah, she I, 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 to her, at that point, when Berlin dies, she's thinking, I lost everything because of you. That scene where she's in the taxi, and I think that she was actually seeing Tom go into that, into that, um diner or cafe where where, he, where Tom meets Red and he gives him that envelope. It is it is one of the saddest thing and I want to give kudos to Megan Boo because that scene was it was one of those short powerful scenes that I don't think she gets a lot of recognition for. I agree. Yeah, I mean because I I've all, I've gone back and forth on if she sees him or not, but it doesn't make any sense for her not to have seen him there. I'm not entirely sure why she was there. Maybe she just had a meeting with Red and she was leaving. Or maybe she just needed to see him again. Yeah, I think that 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 she took a cab. Red probably asked her if she wanted a, a lift of the boat. She probably said said no. Took a cab and followed Red, and was looking at Tom as Tom got in there because she knew exactly what was going to happen. Red was going to offer him something to go away, and he goes away. So that's the last time, and it basically feels like. He's being paid off to leave, and he's taking that and leaving. Mm -hmm. And I think at that time her feelings were so contradictory. She she wanted, she loved him, and she hated him, and she wasn't at peace with with what she wants. And I think at that point we were talking about the, the darkest moments for the Keens, and I I kind of take back what I was saying because I was saying when he was 
you know, baiting her on the boat and such. I think Dresden is the darkest place for Tom. Because that moment when we see him, he, he goes undercover, he shaves his head, he goes undercover, he takes, he wants anything. And Bud looks at him and says, Did, don't tell me that girl got to you. And he just kind of shakes his head like, are you, are you kidding me? Is this where we're going with this? And he goes in, he changes everything about himself. Everything. You know, shaves his head, gets some new tattoos, you know, um, goes all neo-Nazi on us, you know. And goes and, over. And they have that lovely conversation when he calls to say goodbye. Yeah, it, that is so nice right there. And he, and the fact that she just keeps talking to him—it's why are you calling me? And then she keeps going. You know, <laughs> it's, is that disconnect between Liz, Liz actions and Liz words? It's because she knows at, at that point where she is. She, the logical side of her brain is going up on him you don't want anything to do with this man he hurts you he's horrible for you etc 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 and yet her heart is in a different place you know her head and her heart aren't quite meshing right there it's and i i think that there was also have that tiny little moment that was delightful because he gives her a tip that actually saves her life because and then, not only that, but it exposes further his manipulative side when they were married. And, and it's, it's so sweet, though, because when he finds out she's going undercover, he gets so excited. Because it's like, I get to share something real with you. I'm sharing this with you. And it's me. It's not the fake me. It's really me. And he's mm -hmm. excited to give her those tips and excited to share that with her because it's something he enjoys doing. And that little moment there, and it's like when she goes, oh, well, I thought you just had allergies. It's like it all comes crashing down and it's like, and you just killed the moment, babe. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but then it's funny because she remembers. She remembers and she does it. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, was and then Red just and obviously it's a book that Red knows because he immediately comes to her rescue, mm -hmm. you know, and tells her exactly what you know the dinky was. Spycraft one hundred and one, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, right I, there I, with the duct tape and how you wrap a body that you just kill, feet up, start by the head, exactly where you put the duct tape in. Yep, they go by the same book. But yeah, and, that, uh, that call is, is probably one of my very favorites between them. And they have some great calls there. But, um... And, and then the next time they see each other, well, they well, are... Well, in Dresden, Dresden's pretty big. Because there's a scene there I wanted to touch on real fast mm -hmm. with Tom. And he goes over and you see him try to dive into this new persona. And he's good at it. He's very good at it. But you see the stress there at that point because he goes in and he picks the biggest guy in the room and beats the living hell out of him I mean just I mean, you can tell that there's so much and it, that is not fake right there that is him using the situation to let off as much stress as he can because he has to focus on the job and he can't because there's this woman who keeps appearing in his mind. You know, I, I don't think he was able to shake Liz the entire time he was there, no matter how deep he got. And then Rhett shows up, delivers the thing. Bressler is like, what? We came to get him. And Rhett is like, we came to deliver a message and we did. That's because Red knew. Red knew he was going to be back. And... And I, and that that I think is it's my point where where that is the first time that the second time actually the first time is when he gives him that package and he's not talking to an operative he's talking to a man in love with his daughter. Yeah, definitely. But I I love and we mentioned it on I think the Red and, and Tom mm -hmm. podcast, but it it fits very well here. This is the first time he's called her Lizzie in forever. Is where he says, Lizzie dropped me in that hell hole and, and I'm done. I'm done. And then immediately, as soon as he hangs up with Red, the next time you see him, he's obviously hopped on a plane and gone to D.C. And so... The a lot of people say that is because he w was burned with the Germans and uh -uh. he had no place to go. No. I mean, 
are you going to tell me he has succeeded in every op that he's ever had in his life? One, he probably could have salvaged that. And two, even if he couldn't, why didn't he go back to Bud? That would have been the best choice. You know, Red showed up. This is what happened. You know, crap happens. That's what, you know, that, that happens mm. in that, that world. But instead, I love the fact that Bud doesn't even acknowledge that it was him who gave Red the information. Place it all the blame on him. Well, Tom learned from the best. You know? mm. <laughs> no, but, I and I'm not going to lie, in that episode... While, when when we were watching it, uh, when it came on air and it was live and everything, I wanted Tom to walk through that door. I, I've had a lot of moments in the blacklist where I'm like, "This is my, my wish." I don't think You're they're gonna give it to me. You. Hmm. You got a, quite a few of those. Oh, I do, but I've noticed I have a I have a habit because the fandom that I came from before Blacklist, I would make wishes, and it's like, oh, that's what you want. Let me give you the direct opposite. You know that it's like the writers had some sort of like I don't, it, I don't know, but regardless, so I I'm very skeptical of getting my hopes up sometimes, and and this was one of those moments. This was before I I, I am now of the opinion that rom- in the romantic sense, which I don't think is like. The huge sense of of the blacklist but for liz's romantic life i think that keen squared is in game that that's my personal opinion just with everything that i've seen um but i was just as ready for reddington to walk through that door as i was tom why because if tom hadn't come back what other choice would red have had to keep liz out of prison Probably go kidnap the judge and tell him I am the informant and um, let's do a deal. I'm going to give you like, you know, 10 good cases that you're going to prosecute and be very well. And uh, the rest you're going to leave to me. And maybe. And maybe a house in the mountains in California. And maybe. But I, I just was kind of expecting them to switch it last second, you know, like you're expecting Tom to walk through and someone else would. So when Tom did walk through, it was, I wasn't quite as surprised as Liz, but I was happily surprised. And because at the time, I wasn't sure he was sticking around. I wasn't sure they were planning to fix the relationship. I wanted them to, but I wasn't sure that they were. That makes mm-hmm. sense. Um, and so, Oh, see, I'm not a shipper and I knew they would. <laughs> yeah, I I am a shipper, and so I understand my heart and my soul is involved in this, and sometimes mm-hmm. that skews my view. And so because I know that my view is skewed, sometimes I go so far in the other you direction it throws me. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what works with me, mm-hmm. or doesn't work with me one way or the other. But anyway, and so when he walks in, her face, some of my favorite gifts that I have stored away in my mini, mini gifts that I keep on my computer is that expression she has when he walks up and he looks at her and she just looks up at him like, what are you doing? And the judge goes, Mr. Keene, I'm so, what was it? Uh, I'm so relieved. Someone told me you were dead. (laughs) It's just, and Tom does this hard blink when he's resetting. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the best way I've come to describe it. I'm I'm not. Brett does it too. A little bit, yeah. Uh, I haven't noticed as much, but I also don't watch Red nearly as closely as I watch to- all of Tom's little quirks. And with Tom, whenever he's kind of preparing for something, I've noticed that he does that really hard blink. And so he's standing there, and the judge goes, who are you? And he does that hard blink. He goes, my name is Tom Keen. And so it's... He knew exactly what he was saying. He was there to confess the murder of Eugene Ames to get Liz off. And that conversation with the judge, and yet we have yet another confirmation from someone outside of Liz and Tom about Tom loving Liz and vice mm-hmm. versa. We keep getting them all over the place. And it's, it's beautiful because it's like, you two, everybody else knows it. Just go. <laughs> you know? So why do you think there's so many people that can't see it? They don't want to. I, I, I'm not the Good best per- I'm not the best person to ask that because I am I do ship them. I do love them and I do see mm. it. And so 
I if I had hopped on board Keenler early on. I, I love Ress. I adore him. And, you know, I mean, I could have just as easily, I suppose, hopped on board Keenler early on. But I didn't. I The Keens were the ones that, that grabbed my attention, and the rest mm. is history. You know? Yeah, I never... I, I always... From the very moment they appeared, I knew that a they weren't what they what what they looked like, and b that they were going to be together because they actually loved each other. And I didn't know about Katerina, I didn't know about any of that, but I absolutely knew that. Um, I was worried about the trope of there are so many, especially in a, a heightened reality like this. The couple that starts together often doesn't end together. And I, I think that a lot of people kind of held on to that, you know, with various, you know, oh, well, he was the first love. He'll go away, you know. But but not in Spice. Um, spyware is different. They are uh, the, the romantic relationships in Spice are the the means by which they are written is not usually the regular one in comedies and romantic comedies. It's usually they do love each other, but they're either on the opposite sides, Ren and Katerina, or they are supposed to be on opposite sides, or it's not. That, that's the vehicles used in the genre more. Mr. So, and Mrs. Smith. Yes. I mean, that's. And, but they, and, there's really something there. The writers have said that on Twitter officially. I mean, the, the King Squared group was saying that for, for years. And then suddenly, I don't even remember which. Maybe Metzger? I, I don't remember which one tweeted. He was like, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And people got so offended by that. And he's like, that's what it was. <laughs> you know, that's that was the point of it. I'm sorry if you couldn't see that. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it's not their fault that people don't want to see it. But, I mean, when I saw that fight, that's exactly what I thought of. I went, yeah. I, I went and rented that movie, actually. I was like, I haven't seen that in years. Oh, yep. that reminds me of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I suddenly went to watch that I love that fight, the Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I oh, it's love gorgeous. It. Yeah. And I think that, that, that you know, we're getting, we're getting now to the point where, okay, he says he's going to save it. And he's just telling the judge, I don't care what you do, but I will confess to anything as long as you let it go. And there is a lot of people saying, oh, but that is because he had nowhere to go. He had other places to go. He could have just gone to Bud. He could have just done anything. This is a guy who can disappear. And, and this is also a man that is going to him, turning himself in for that. And add into the list of people who hate them, not just Red, who hate them before, but now Bud, the mm-hmm. Germans, in Berlin. Yeah. Yay. Well, Berlin, Berlin was dead by that point. It um, isn't. Well, then. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But um, but regardless, it, he could have been put on death row. Mm-hmm. And he so killed the cop. He was willing to give up his life for her freedom. And so, I mean, because once they started digging, it, who knows what they'd find, you know? If he was willing to give up anything, you know? Yeah. And so, it, it was... And, and ex- Bond, Bond, Bond could even understand about the Germans, but it was, you went to the feds. I mean, that like, that is like the, the capital sin of undercover agents. You don't go to the feds. And I think that's what did it in for Bud. It's It wasn't the fact that he screwed over the Germans. It wasn't even the fact that he screwed... Well, maybe Redding, Reddington simply for the fact that Reddington came after Bud. Like, I don't think Bud cared about the fact that Tom screwed over Reddington until it suddenly became Bud's problem. Uh, that was the moment it suddenly mattered. You know, three, four years later, it became an issue. Um, mm-hmm. How but, about that baby picture? Oh, my God. Okay, that... <laughs> That has my heart right there. Um, so, calls Liz. I, I also loved that conversation. You know, in, you know, he, she's like, why are you calling me? So, oh, no, no. There, there's a conversation right after Tom gets released that's fantastic. Yes. Are you okay? That becomes one of their things. Are you okay? Are you okay? And for a while their relationship is pretty much entirely over the phone it's these phone calls that they shouldn't be making that they are making Mm -hmm. and liz not quite able to hang up because you don't see her hang up with him when Mm -mm. she goes where are you does that mean if he had told her that she was gonna go maybe maybe she Mm -hmm. wanted to see him 
you know, maybe in that moment, in that horrifying moment for her, all she wanted to do was do exactly what she did in, uh, later on in the season, go knock on his door and just be like, hold me, you know, make, make mm-hmm. everything else go away. And because she said in season one, this is the only man, this is the man that I chose that made me feel safe. I yeah. think there there are times when she doesn't feel safe around him when she's mm-hmm. believing the, that he doesn't love her and such. But at the point that she even started considering that he loved her again, you know, that, that he had never stopped loving her and that it had never been a lie, I think that she started feeling safe again with him. Mm-hmm. Obviously safe enough to call him to her motel room, let her let him know where she was living and have him come to her. The, the, there's an important thing in in here. I don't know um, if you got the dossier. I did. Yeah. Oh, there is a there is an interesting thing in in the dossier in the part of the Cyprus agency. She talks there that for her there was a pivotal moment because it made her realize that she could not adopt a child, and the reason she couldn't adopt a child, I know that she tells Tom that it was her that it was because something was wrong with them but the truth is what she says in the dossier is that it was I didn't know who I was I I had an identity crisis I had no idea who I was where it came from and what my, what was my history and I in the next conversation after after the harbor master when when Tom and Red give the the, the speech about you know you can't you know, there's a slippery road down there. When it, it's her birthday, and that is a moment where she's in. This this is coming back, and she's now saying, you know, I'm 30 years old. I got no 31 years old. I am no I have no idea who I am. I have no idea of my real name or where I come from, and it's coming. It's crashing down on her, and that's a moment where you know she has that that birthday dinner with wrestler comes back and Tommy's in the apartment. Yeah. And it's such an interesting scene. And he says, I I didn't know where else to go, which that, that phrase has been used multiple times throughout the blacklist. Liz says it to, to red, uh, in Gina Sanatakos when she meets him in the park. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where else to go. Because, I mean, her husband's in interrogation. She's been kicked off the case. She had nobody that could understand. And so she tells him that. And then she tells Wrestler the same thing. I believe that's also in season one. Mm-hmm. Where she ends up at his mm-hmm. at his apartment. She goes, I don't have to After Tommy's gone and Red. And she's angry with Red. And she doesn't mm-hmm. want to talk to Red. Yeah. And she has nowhere to go. And so she shows up and she says, I had nowhere else to go. And then you turn around and it's Tom saying it to her. It's just, It's an interesting little bit there you know Mm -hmm. I I don't know what it means if it means anything but it it is interesting that it's been said at least three times between you know Liz with two guys and then Tom to her and I think it's a point where where your whole world is crashing down and you know they were busy they were lucky because they still got all of them had one person they could go yeah and I do wonder about Red Red sometimes I wonder Mm -hmm. if that was Kate Kaplan to him. No, I could see that. Then Bay maybe, but probably Kate. Um, but him showing up at the hotel, scaring the living daylights out of her because I mean, not like he put the the lights she, on. She just had half a bottle of wine with well, wrestler. She's she, he's lucky she didn't shoot him again. <laughs> Because you know she was caring. I mean, that's the way you get shot, buddy. <laughs> but she was—he was scared. I yeah, mean, he was. And, and bef- before, right before that scene where he shows her the apartment, is probably to me the point where Tom starts to rise. It is. Um, yeah, I, I do think I, so. I, I don't know when he comes back, but I think that is—is is that scene and is a fantastic scene. Kudos to the writers. He's he's looking at the mirror in a filthy place, and he takes all his his passports and he burns them. And he's looking in the mirror and he realizes. I think that's a point where he realizes I have no earthly clue 
who he, I am. Ha- he has the same identity crisis that Liz does, basically. You know, and funny, happening on the same night at the same time. I think I want to make a parallel post on that. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they, they're basically having this identity crisis at the exact same time of, I don't know what, what's going on here, and I don't know who I am. And so he shows up there, and she's the one person he can go to. And there's an interesting comment that, that he turns and makes to Bud after, you know, the, the Germans are releasing him. And he goes, that woman that you said that was going to get me killed, she just saved my life. And so he goes to Liz, because she's the only one that he knows to go to. Yes, she tells him to get out, but it's it's after he starts bringing up the the um the passports he starts he starts bringing up these and she's like no <laughs> and she was the one who stole it she says throw in the dossier she went into evidence and stole them for him mm-hmm. well i mean obviously he she showed up with them oh a lot of people were saying that wrestler gave it to her what i never heard that one no mm-hmm. no somehow i if she had asked wrestler he would have gone are you serious <laughs> It's kind of like like the comment in season we four. We got to wait for season four to get there. Yeah. And I love that. Do you know how much trouble I would be in? Fine. Go. Go. <laughs> I loved him in that. <laughs> no, but my favorite moment there, and it, it parallels back to season one where she attacked Red with the pin. That that just, that, and it also parallels with the dream that we see in earlier season two. Before we know for sure Tom's alive, we, we get that, that dream sequence mm-hmm. of Tom being in her hotel room and Red shooting him and everything. And she's just terrified in that dream. And then she opens the door to shove Tom out. You assume. I mean, she, she's trying to get him to leave. She, I mean, obviously, Red would have heard what's going on because she's going, get out now, you know, screaming at him. I can't imagine those motel, ro- those motel walls are very thick. And so Red raises his weapon, and then immediately Liz goes, no, and has her gun drawn. And then Bev throws her gun at her. It's a beautiful scene. Oh, it is. It's gorgeous. But she is willing to draw her gun on Red, which is incredibly rare for her to do that. Draw her gun on Red immediately without pause, because I can just, I can see it playing in her brain. It's about to happen. He's about to kill him. I can't let him do it. His anger, it goes back to as angry as she is at him, she does not want to lose him. Yeah. And so. Yeah, she's a brave woman. Because, oh. uh, I mean, stabbing Red on a pan, with a pan the day you meet her or punch Rostov, that takes guts. Yeah. I mean, these guys are obviously, you know, pretty out there, and she goes ahead and does it. Um. So we've talked about the uh, the passports, and we've talked about um, the the yo yoing conversation of you know imagine your life without him. Yeah, and and, and the the yo yo. I mean, that's a that's an interesting point where Lily, when Liz stops looking at, at Tom as a yo yo, like I need you now, I don't go away, which is what Tom does, what Red does with Tom. He's like, I need you now, go away. I don't need you anymore. Out. I, I don't know if Liz ever really looked at him quite to that degree that Red does. Now, Red definitely does there because he goes... You she know, was trying, I think, and didn't couldn't do it. No. It's not in her nature. And I loved it that Tom called him on that. I was out. You know, <laughs> you brought me back in. Um, but you see Liz call Tom the next day. Okay, um, but there's a scene and he says, is, is he still mad about last night? Uh, oh, that, that's when that's he's... Because it goes, it goes into Liz uh, telling him that he needs the, the Shelf Corporation. That's in the Jeff motel Red's... room. Yeah, that, yeah. that's... Uh, they're sitting in the motel room, and, and he, she's called Tom for help. And he asks, he goes, is Red still pissed about last night? It's either in the motel room or in the car later. And uh, I, I think they're in his... In his yeah, in the car. I, I do want to know, because he was pickpocketing when she called him. So obviously he had no money. Where on earth did he get money to buy a brand new Ford Mustang? Because I just bought one that was used, and those things aren't cheap. <laughs> You're not going to pickpocket and get enough to go put a down payment on it. I don't think that he didn't have any money. I think that what happened is without passports, he couldn't get to the money. 
couldn't get to his it. assets. Maybe that was it, or, but but he shows up with the car before the passports. Because he shows up to her motel room with the deal, still? I will I will trade you this. It may be that someone owed him a favor. You know, I, I could see that. I could see Tom having a lot of favors owed all around the place. You know, probably probably they needed a, a favor of, of pushing the the Mustang in there. But yeah, I mean, I, I could see that that he had money. But not immediate access because you don't go through your life and and no. and obviously you know in season three and four you see that he buys the boat he buys so there was some money that he had left mm-hmm. that he had safeguarded um, I think that then he he gets himself a car or he has a friend or whatever yeah. but I don't think he was penniless but he didn't have access to money in that moment that's what he was pickpocketing yeah um, but and or so, just not. and that that's the first one of the first times you actually see them working together and when they go to meet his uh his friend that that runs the shelf corporation ziggy i love ziggy you too i want i'm like can i be your friend can we be friends because you're kind of cool <laughs> i just and, I love that. I, is this just... your woman is what what ziggy yeah. asks and liz says more like his ball and chain and yeah gina uses that exact phrase later tell the ball and chain you'll call her back which tells me that Gina traced him through Ziggy. Maybe. Eh, maybe. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty normal Yeah, phrase. those expressions. That's true. That's true. They did, the writers it, it's are one of those consistent. loose ends that, that people don't notice that they're, that they've happened. I mean. Yeah, that's fair. That That's incredibly fair. The writers are very purposeful in what they do. Their, their wording is purposeful. Um, mm-hmm. And so you've got all of that, and then you've got that gorgeous scene. She hands him the the um, passports. It's another one of those this could be goodbye moments. Like, mm-hmm. we keep saying goodbye. They're not very good at goodbyes. I'm very happy that the Keens are bad at goodbyes. Because they mm-hmm. continuously say them, and then never really last. Um, but then there's that gorgeous moment. It's one of my very favorites between them. In which she says, you know... It couldn't all be a lie. Your laugh, the baby, you know, you're not that good of an actor. And... That's why I didn't see it, because so much was real. Yeah, and you can just see it in his face. He's just like, ah, you know, you get it. You know, maybe even something that he couldn't put into words himself. She gets it. And she says, can you be honest? You've got to be honest. And he's, yeah. Well, it, it, well the, what he answers is also, you know, you're my greatest success. Yes. Because yes. I may, I got into so much of a life that I realized that I... Yeah, that you're the first I, person that made me feel happy, made me feel like I had a life. That and somebody, that somebody cared. Want, that is so sad. It is that someone cared. And it's, oh, God, it was just so painful. Because it's true. She is the first person in the, in his memory has ever loved him. And honestly, probably loved him for him, but, and so she asks him to be honest, and he says he, he will. She asks him about the passports, and in that moment, he chooses. He can't betray Redden. He can't betray Reddington. He chooses the job, you know, the, the overarching job over her. And Is it, you think, the job or fear? I think it's Because a at that moment, I think that there's, there's more fear. I got more fear because... He's he's in a very vulnerable point. He has he knows that the major is out to get him. Yeah, if the major you know, got out, may, he's a dead man. Is what he knows. Yes, yeah. and he's he can't. I don't think that he can afford to piss red. Yeah, because he has no safeguard. Liz took most of his money. Uh, Liz, he has only a few passports that she gave him. He is basically very vulnerable and pissing off Red at that point mm-hmm. might have been a death sentence because it's not he's not sure that Liz will protect him. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I think it could have been a combo thereof, but I think it's also mm-hmm. a, a choosing the job. Um, it's Because I, mean, I think that's pretty deeply ingrained in him by this point. I mean, he was 14 years old when he started this. Mm-hmm. And he's, what, 30 at this point, you know, where we are. And so... It's, I mean. How about he's... hurting her? He's going to really hurt her by telling this about Red. That's true. That's also, I, that's a very fair point. He may, 
it may be a very complex reason, you know, a mix of fear. Wait a minute, you're, saying it's, you're saying it's layered? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise in the blacklist. <laughs> it's, you know, because at that point, you got to know the list care for red. And at the same time, you're going to tell her that you're going to destroy whatever is left of her naive of whatever she, little that she has left of naivete it's going to be taken away and knowing that coming from someone other than red how painful that's going to be and so mm-hmm. and so he chooses not to tell her and she walks she kisses him and walks and every time someone says oh she's not strong she's not strong look at her just give to tom my response was she doesn't just give to tom she puts down an ultimatum and when he doesn't abide by the ultimatum she walks away it she doesn't come back because she just couldn't stand to be without him which she doesn't want to do this without him she's she's made that comment before but when they start rebuilding their relationship one of the huge huge milestones for them is him calling her and saying and, and choosing to be honest he chooses to put her in front of his fear in front of the job in front of everything she I also a- think it's trusting, trusting yeah. that Liz is strong enough to support. Because now that the more I think about it, the more I see that fear of hurting Liz as being part of it. And you're right. He's, he's that going to be the turning point. That's that's where he opens, closes one door and opens mm-hmm. another door. Yeah, I think that's that's the he was kind of lingering in that the intermedium there between coming back from Dresden and that point. And that's when he takes that final step and, and shuts the door behind him. And then he's moving forward. I don't, at that point, he would never have been able to go back to the life he lived. Like he's never going to be able to do deep, deep, long-term deep cover ever again after that, because he's, Liz broke he's him. He's chosen a life. Yeah. He's chosen a life. Liz broke him in all the right ways. Um, glad she did but so we go on from there and she goes and red gets shot yeah she goes and confirms it with red and i love that scene so much um because she's not under any delusions about tom she knows he's a liar she knows that that's what he knows what he's comfortable with he's an undercover agent i always had a problem with people calling be undercover agents liar it's their job yeah. that's a like calling a, a, a dancer graceful like it's a bad thing it's what they do you know <laughs> you kind of hope they're a good liar otherwise they're dead it's like... yeah i mean an undercover agent that doesn't that can't lie well i mean look at wrestler he did pretty good and most of it because he wasn't lying you choose your lies sparingly carefully yes <laughs> and um and so you, you have that that point where she brings Red unconscious halfway through surgery into his warehouse. She says that she didn't expect him to be there. I don't know why she wouldn't. I, you know, I, she probably knew it was a 50-50 chance that he was still there. Brings him in and he says, I'm doing this for you, not for him. Mm-hmm. And I love that there, and the various little snips and snats back and forth, especially when Nick shows up. Well, if it's any consolation, she dumped me too. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just that, that whole, you can feel the tenseness there, you know, you know that there's a lot of tenseness there, but then by the end of the episode, who is she calling? She's calling him to say, I mm-hmm. need help. Tell me all you know about Red. Yeah. Because she had offered, he said, I know a lot about Red and I can help you. Yeah, and so she turned I, him down there. that conversation. Yeah, I would love to know what he told her. Yeah, that conversation about that river. And I love because that's like, it's like, that is the old, almost the oldest. You, you can see she has like dirty hair and she's just had a shock of her life. Um, she, she discovered who put, Tom in her life, you know, he was shot. Uh, she saw the picture of her mother in the apartment. She walked into the office of the director of clandestine services and played them the fulcrum to save Red. 
she's had a hell of a day. I I would have had a glass of wine with a shot of something stronger in it <laughs> by that point. <laughs> it's I would have been asking him out for drinks, not out by a river. Um, <laughs> that's and a lot yet of stress. she's asking, tell me all you know about Reddington. Yeah. And we have no idea what that conversation was. No, but we do know that that puts them on the path of working together. And that starts, I, I don't know how long that is in there. I would say it could be anywhere between a month or two in which she's searching for Katerina and he's helping to get her answers and they're working together. Mm, you don't think no. so? No, 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 no. I, I've kind of timed that. There is only, in between those two episodes, there is um, maybe, um, because it says, uh, hold on a second, I'll tell you, uh, five days ago. So it's five days that have happened between that day that Red was shot and the day where in Leonard Cole when when he says, "Excuse me, I intended to be here before," and Cole tells him, "It's you were shot five days ago." You're right, but uh, I'm thinking of something else. But you're, you're correct on that. Um, it's when she finds the picture of Katarina and shows up, and that that's another huge step for them. Um, is showing up on his doorstep and and that's between finding the picture of Kennery when they start searching for Katarina you don't know how long oh, that, that is that, the hug in the rain but yeah the hug in the rain is the next I think big big step there because she's stressed she doesn't have any work she doesn't have anywhere else to go so she goes to Tom and I love that he opens the door and he says you know do you want to talk about it she just shakes her head and he walks out I think that's the first touch he's initiated with the exception of, like, reaching out to stop her when she's walking away from him when he lies about the, the passports. Um, I, I find interesting in, in, in going with the things that you advance that, that Red hasn't learned to trust her. And maybe with reasons, because we have no idea what is the reasons he has. But on that moment when this is out, is in the rain in her car, she takes out her phone and she looks at the picture that she just snapped of the picture of Katerina. And Red is calling her. At the same time, Red is in the apartment, in the, in the apartment, sitting down, looking at the, that picture. And um, he looks at a picture, looks at a book. I'd love to see what the book is. And calls her. She ignores him, and she goes to Tom. And I think it is the 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 strongest indicative that your thing about telling the truth was that she went to Tom because Tom had chosen the truth. Yeah, I agree, and I think that's something Liz needs as a character. She's she has so many questions in her life. She needs for the people that she has closest to her to be solid. She needs to be able to trust them, and. When she feels like she can trust them, that puts her in a better place. That puts her in a more solid place. Ooh, we're missing something very important. We're missing what Red actually, the first step that Red takes in terror her and tell her something that he's deeply troubling with. When he has been shot and he tells her the reasons he, he, he um, hired Tom, and it's the first time he tells her that Tom loved her. And I think that is a final thing that she needed to go back and, and, and give her some the permission to go back to him. I it agree. wasn't all in his hair, in his head. In her head, she didn't just see it. He did love her. I agree. I, I do think that that was the moment where she realized that for certain. And so going, going to Tom, I, I love that, that you just said about it was about who did she trust in that moment. She trusted Tom over Red in that moment. And so she goes to him and he just he just steps out. He doesn't ask her for for details. He knows exactly what she needs and just holds on to her. In the rain, doesn't pull her inside. He steps out into the rain, into the mess and the storm with her. I think that's very symbolic. You know, he's he's safe, he's dry. He steps out into the storm with her rather than pulling her inside. You know, he's, he goes to meet her. Mm -hmm. He gives her what she needs at the cost. You know, I, and 
I know that in the grand scheme of things, getting a little wet is not a big cost, but you know, I'm a writer. We're looking at the, you know, the, the sim symbolism here. You know, he steps out in there giving up his own safety, dryness, comfort to give her the comfort where she needs it, when she needs it, how she needs it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a beautiful moment in which we really see that the loving husband that worked so hard to give her what she needed in season one was not an act. Yes, mm -hmm. he had to work hard, but it's because he loved her. He wanted to work hard for that. And so I... <laughs> I feel so bad for him the next morning when he, you know, when she comes to breakfast and she's backpedaling on everything. He's like, but I do know you, you know, <laughs> see, I'm proving it, you know, right here. I do know you. Let, let's try this because I think he sees in her the second chance. This, this hope well, he always for second makes chance. her smile. And that's a funny thing because. You know, when when they bring the bacon to the bacon, the two percent coffee, extra crisp, you know, I mean, she she starts laughing because she she realizes that. The, and then she makes a comment about the, the tattoo. He goes and removes the tattoo. Next time we see Tom, no tattoo. So and, he went out of there and got the tattoo removed. And the uh, the boat, the naked boat scene. The, the naked yes. boat comment and like I remember when that that episode aired people were like are you serious is that you're such a guy you're such a typical guy you know getting really angry at him I was like guys chill he was making her smile he was teasing her I mean yeah if she was willing to like go sleep with him he was fine with that but you know that he was teasing her that's what and then they did. have the naked boat scene <laughs> they have the naked boat scene <laughs> Um, but yeah, I love that there, and yes, yeah, she ignores his call later, but when, when all hell breaks loose, I, Red says, you know, Tom's calling to, to take you away, and she goes to him, and in the end of it, it she trusts him to go after and drop off, she trusts him to help her in that when Red won't. She continues to trust him, and that trust isn't betrayed. In that moment when they're sitting on the boat there together, and she says, you know, I, I just keep thinking, you know, the boat, the boat, why didn't I get on his boat? And she's willing to give up a lifetime of dreams of finding out about her past, about her parents, about everything to be with him I know it's a very emotional I think reaction. she wanted to 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 skate to that was Liz escaping I think that there were some things that that Liz was afraid of and 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 th this whole thing presented her with a choice of maybe get away from everything maybe. you know dream a little keep yeah. her innocence it was still a beautiful... I'm it a was a beautiful I'm, I'm a shipper. Let me have my pretty moment. <laughs> it was a beautiful scene because... You know what I loved about that? That it was... The way they filmed it, um, although it was a sex scene, it really was a love scene. It, and, Which, yeah. and, and that is hard to do. It is. It was Without a very... It being cheesy. It was a very, very tender scene. You know, it's you, you can tell there's passion between them, but it's it wasn't just a romp in the sheets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was very well done. And I I really liked it. Um and then she gets up the next morning and she she goes and he's getting ready. And I love the fact that he, he walked her through, you know, the night before and says if you make this decision, this is what you're giving up. If you make this decision, I need you to be aware. I'm happy to do this with you. I want to do this with you. But if you do it, these are the consequences. And he spells them out for her and then asks her again, exactly what do you mean, you know, when she says stuff. You know, he's very careful with the whole situation. Mm -hmm. And the next morning when she goes and she looks and she finds out that Cooper has been lied to in all of this he lets her go and 
I, I'm a big Beauty and the Beast fan, and I remember at the time, it was so funny because I, I'm, I used to be a big Once Upon a Time, it's a show on ABC fan, and my favorite character off there is the, the Beauty and the Beast couple. And they were just destroying them on there. And I remember that scene happened where where she says, I have to go. And he goes, uh-huh. She goes, I'll be back. And he went, no, you won't. And it's not a guilt trip. It's just, you're not coming back. I know this, but it's okay. You have to go. This is what you have to do. And he lets her go. And I went, well, at least one of my shows gave me my Beauty and the Beast moment. <laughs> you know? And, and it's go. funny because I think that he, in that moment he's thinking, well, I have to go too. Um, and that is the this other moment where he thinks, well, okay, I guess she chose to go find his things and I'm going to find mine. And well, he turns he also, and he goes. I think he also felt like Bud was probably closing in on him. That, and if he didn't actually, leave, he would be. Yep. And and then, um, he's he's gone, and and Liz kills. Um, and I think, you know, I think in a way, you know, just looking for from from theory and writing, I think that there was Liz had fears and that moment where he thinks I'm gonna maybe get in the boat. I think there was a little fear of the things I'm going to find. She had just found out that her mother was a KGB spy, and her name, she thinks, is Masha Rostova. Um, and she realizes everything she knew about her life is a lie. And I also... What Fred told her in 102. I also think that when Tom left, he was under the impression that she had everything she needed to clear her name. That when yeah. he left, he thought she was safe. Yeah. As he found out she wasn't safe, he came back. Yeah. yeah. But, but that's she was with Red, too. And, and I think at that point, that's when, <clears throat> when Tom started to think, okay, he's not, he, he's not using her. Yeah, I agree. Well, that's going to wrap up this episode, and we will launch into Season 3 and 4A next week. And we'll also be uh, touching on the question of the week then as well, which will be the question of three weeks since this is a three-part episode basically just that an ass there yeah um and so if you would like to get a hold of us if you'd like to answer the question of the week or if you would like to leave comments we are on facebook we're on tumblr and twitter and you can listen to us on soundcloud itunes and youtube and we are really excited to be wrapping this up next week can't wait to do and, it. Yeah. And if you have any other questions about what we have talked that we have not um, talked to your satisfaction or you think we can do better, just let us know. We're happy to tackle. We love this. We're this as a little masochist in the little masochist in us. Yeah. And, and you get a theorist and a character development fan together, and we like those hard questions. They they are bread and butter. <laughs> mm-hmm. So see you next week. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right.